All right, we'll get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, my name, if you haven't met me, is Anthony Smith. I'm the uh, current chair of the Air Burgess Department. Also with me tonight is Chris Thorpe, the Executive Manager of Operations. Tonight's topic is about the flight envelope. There was a flutter incident in a uh, light sports aircraft touring motor glider on the 29th of December. It resulted in quite severe damage to the glider. One of the um, outcomes of the investigation was a, a, a poor knowledge of the flight envelope. And uh, this is the first part of a, an attempt at rectifying some of that deficiency in knowledge. So a few warnings, as per the last webinar I did, uh, it's not the purpose of the aircraft investigation or incident investigation to apportion blame or liability. The sole objective is to learn from the event and to prevent the, or try to prevent future accidents and incidents. We're not going to reveal the identity of those involved. Uh, for that reason, we're also not going to reveal the type nor the location. Um, the general caveat, we're not going to blame or shame anybody out of this. We really want a no blame environment so people can be confident that they are able to report an incident or an event uh, without having any uh, recourse aimed at them. Uh, if you do know the identity of the people involved, do not reveal their names either verbally or in chat or by any other means during this webinar. It is being recorded, it is going on YouTube. Um, as I said, it's important we have a defect report, a source system and a defect reporting system that members can be expected to be treated with confidentiality and this no blame culture. That's really important to us. Um, I'm sure that there's a whole stack of events and defects that go unreported and we're not the big shame out of that is that we're not going to learn from and improve things into the future. So this is um, the first presentation in a set of two that re uh, relates to a flutter incident in a light sports aircraft touring rotor glider. This is going to talk about the flight envelope. Uh, we'll talk about what happened and some of the sequence of events. Uh, we'll go into a, a detailed explanation of the flight envelope and we'll have a bit of a Q&A session afterwards. If you have questions, um, please use the, uh, the questions uh, box or, or the chat list and I'll try and answer them as and when I can. There will be a second webinar that will talk about Flutter. Uh, that's going to be on Wednesday the 1st of June. Um, we decided to break it up because Flutter itself is quite a detailed and complex topic and I wanted to try and separate the two and make it a little bit easier to, for people to digest. So what happened? Uh, this LSA Touring Motor Glider took off later in the afternoon in the middle of summer. Approximately four minutes into the flight, whilst on climb, um, passing through three and a half thousand feet, and at a fairly high speed, um, this aircraft is actually fitted with a two-axis autopilot. Uh, it's the first time I understand this pilot had been trying to use the autopilot, so the autopilot was engaged. Rather than continuing the climb as the pilot expected, the aircraft pitched nose down to flight level and accelerated up to and briefly exceeding V &E. so that's 120 knots true airspeed. Before which after which time the uh, pilot uh, took over the controls, uh, overrode the autopilot and pulled up. Um, these light sports aircraft in the touring motor glider category are uh, very lightweight aircraft and this one has an 80 horsepower motor so it's a very clean design and has a reasonable horsepower to kilograms kind of ratio. So fairly, being able to climb at 100 knots is uh, no mean achievement. 
Sometime whilst in the vicinity of V&E, a succession of bangs was heard with a louder final bang. The pilot performed a controllability check and decided that it was okay to continue uh, and continued on a cross country for nearly two hours. After landing at the destination and getting out, the pilot noticed that the fuselage tail boom uh, immediately at the leading edge of the fin to uh, fuselage junction had experienced a major structural failure some 70 percent of the structure had been cracked so you can see a significant tension failure on the photo of the left that's the starboard side of the fin uh, and some awful compression kinds of failures on the right hand side photo which is the left hand side of the fin there is some uh, in-flight video from the cockpit the uh, pilot was using a 360 action cam style of camera during the flight uh, I can't show you that video because it shows the pilot's face. But what you do see in the video during the flight after this event is the vertical tail wobbling around visibly uh, and somewhat alarmingly during the rest of the flight. So a quick sequence of events. The takeoff late in the afternoon, it was a thermaling day. Uh, the day was starting to die down, but it was still thermals around the place. The uh, autopilot is very simple. It uh, holds altitude and set to track. There is a ability in the autopilot to define a maximum speed. Uh, and once the autopilot reaches that maximum speed, it can't control the throttle, so it will commence a pull up. But that uh, maximum speed was not set. The peak airspeed was 121 knots, v &E is 120. The ASI does underread by approximately four knots at this speed, so it's likely to be in the order of 125 knots uh, calibrated airspeed. The um, autopilot does record a lot of the flight data, so we have actually for a, a sailplane incident, uh, a very comprehensive set of flight data. There was an amount of roll and yaw immediately during this event. Uh, it's not certain the sequence of events at this point when the bangs were heard and what the aircraft, how the aircraft responded. We don't know the exact timing of that. Um, the pilot reduced the engine power and disengaged the autopilot, checked out for controllability, decided that it was okay to continue. But during the rest of the flight, the pilot noted that they were having to constantly apply right rudder to maintain straight flight from that point onwards. And at just after 6.30, the aircraft landed at its destination. The right hand side of the tail boom failed in tension. You'll notice that it's at about a pretty close on 45 degree angle. Um, which to me indicates a fair degree of torsion that the vertical tail is trying to twist itself off the fuselage boom. Uh, the fuselage boom still retained reasonable vertical stiffness, but the lateral stiffness was very poor. So you can wobble the fin around quite alarmingly. During the investigation, they could not find any control free play. Um, the control surfaces were, had a weight and balance carried out and they were all within the published limits. In fact, they were on the good side of published limits, which was surprising. There's been um, two flutter events previously on the types that this aircraft is derived from. So this is a, there's a chain of designs involved in this aircraft. Uh, the, these were largely blamed on elevator flutter. I'm not sure that's necessarily correct. And we'll talk a bit about this in a couple of weeks time when we do the flutter discussion. The aircraft um, was being recommended beyond, the, so operated beyond the recommended airspeeds, but not by a very large amount. This still occurred within the realms of the flight envelope. 
the most likely reason that we can determine so far is that the tail boom had received some damage during a previous crosswind landing or something similar to that which had reduced the stiffness of the tail boom such that the flutter speed was reduced to being at or at or near V and E. The investigation recommendations. Um, we've got some doubts about the uh, the flutter worthiness, I guess you'd call, of this type. Uh, it is an LSA. We have forwarded this report onto the type certificate holder, uh, and largely because there's been a number of other events, flutter events on this aircraft type previously recorded. Uh, the second recommendation was pilots should be advised that when there is an in-flight event and that does result in observable changes to the aircraft handling, the flight should be aborted immediately. Uh, in, as I mentioned, it's pretty rare to have an autopilot in a sailplane or, or touring motor glider. Uh, this one does. The uh, maximum airspeed setting should be set, uh, which should offer additional protection from autopilot induced overspeed. In this case, the pilot was climbing on a very high power setting at very high speed in the first place. And the last one, the GFA should raise pilot awareness of the flight envelope uh, to enhance their understanding of flutter and the circumstances that can lead to this phenomenon. Um, as a result of this event, we had a look at the new integrated training program uh, that's just come out with the operations and we've noted that the is not a, uh, a segment there on to discuss the flight envelope. I've had a review of the discussion in the current version of Australian gliding knowledge on the flight envelope, and I think there's a number of changes I'd be recommending to the ops people as a result of that. There's a couple of uh, little things that I disagree with. So moving on towards the flight envelope, um, the first and foremost part to understand is almost every aircraft is designed to a published standard. There's a few uh, uh, experimental types or home builds that are pretty much uh, my own, their own design. They don't necessarily comply with a published standard, but they're very rare and few and, and not and very few in between. The design standard will define a set of loads or limits that the aircraft could be reasonably expected to encounter during its intended use. There's a couple of uh, big um, assumptions there. Reasonably be expected to encounter is one of them. Um, occasionally you will uh, ex uh, encounter something that was not reasonable to expect. And the other one is its intended use. Uh, there's a wide range of design standards out there. We've got things like FAR 25, which apply to airliners like 747s, 787s, A380s. FAR 23, which applies to light aircraft, that's your general aviation, Pipers and Cessna 170s. We've got CS22, which is uh, now the international standard for sailplanes and touring motor gliders. I will point out that uh, in the vintage days, uh, prior to the 1970s, each country had their own design standard for sailplanes and there are some significant differences between those. So uh, apples aren't necessarily all apples when it comes to vintage sailplanes or sailplanes dating from before 1970 to And lastly, there is an ASTM F, you can read it off the screen, that's for the light sports aircraft, LSA. That's intended to be relatively simple to uh, meet the certification standards to try and keep the cost down on these aircraft. Using an aircraft outside of its intended use can result in major problems and history is littered with uh, people who have taken an aircraft that was designed for one intended use and then tried to use it for a completely different outcome and uh, had some rather unfortunate events along the way. These loads and limits are normally expressed as a various airspeeds and G loads. 
So we can then display this conveniently uh, as what's known as a flight envelope diagram. Um, now, I've got page 169 there of Australian gliding knowledge. That might actually reference an older version of Australian gliding knowledge. I think the page numbers are wrong on the slide, so my apologies for that one. So we have a made-up diagram. It's, uh, it's fictitious. It's not from a real aeroplane, but it does reflect the current envelope, minimum envelope from CS22. We have a G load on the vertical axis. We have airspeed on the horizontal axis. And this describes the safe areas that a sailplane is intended to be used for its wing and centre fuselage. We can make up a similar diagram to this for the horizontal tail. It will look slightly different um, because the loads on the horizontal tail are slightly different to that to the wing. And we can make one up for the vertical tail as well, and that will be slightly different again. Uh, one is you won't have uh, a positive G, negative G, so much you have a left and right axis, so to speak, as opposed to a vertical axis. As I said before, the CS22, the forefather was JAR22, uh, came into effect in the early 1970s. Vintage gliders will have different G limits depending on the, the country of origin. So what we have, going from zero G, we have a positive stall line. Uh, you won't be able to fly at high G at low speed because the aircraft will stall out before you can get there. This stall line curves up to the point where you get to 5.3 G. Whoops, go back a slide, Anthony. Um, under CS22, that then tapers down to a design speed of positive 4G. This is the maximum speed that the aircraft that was designed around. It's a design requirement and all sorts of nastiness and things can happen immediately after you get to VV. This line continues down to minus 1.5, which then tapers down to minus 3.6, minus 2.6, I think it is, somewhere in that order of magnitude, um, till it meets the negative stall line down the bottom. You will notice that the curve for the negative stall is slightly different, and that's because we're typically using cambered airfoils, which have a much lower CL max if you're inverted than if you're putting positive G on the aircraft. Stall speed is described as VS at 1G, so this is in the order of 36 odd knots. We've got a couple of other speeds marked. One is V and E. That is marked under the standard as 90% of the aircraft's design speed. So this is the never exceed speed. This buffer between V and E and VD is deliberate. It's intended to allow people to accidentally or unintentionally slip over V and E without having any unfortunate consequences. That's not to say that it's you're allowed to exploit those margins deliberately. The prototype of any new sailplane design will be tested out to VD. Production aircraft will be tested to at the factory to a few knots over V and E, normally four or five knots, to make sure that the design is free from any problems up to V and E. Once you exceed V and E, you're into test pilot school. We've also got VA, that's the maximum manoeuvre speed. It is defined as the point at which the positive store line meets the 5.3G. The, this speed represents the speed, maximum speed at which you can apply full deflection controls, after which you are limited to one third control deflections. It is important to remember that uh, air loads are V squared. So as you increase the airspeed by 10%, the air loads experienced by 
the controls and the rest of the airplane will be 20-21% greater. Uh, the stall line is always represented as the maximum fuselage load for with your wing loading, not necessarily with water ballast, but max fuselage load. Uh, with the vintage gliders, uh, most commonly you will see that they will go to a limit of plus 4G and a limit of minus 2G. And they're often constant all the way out to VD. So CS22 gives you a little bit of extra headroom in the positive, uh, a small amount of headroom in the negative compared to the vintage types, and pretty much the same all the way out to VD. Uh, the English standard that uh, was in use in Australia, including the design of the, uh, the Harry Schneider aircraft, uh, tapered down to zero G on the negative side at VD. Now I'm pretty sure that Harry designed his to meet the, uh, the German standards, which was the BDS, which was minus two all the way out to VD. But it's important to remember that uh, the vintage gliders are going to be a little different from this. And the F way to find out the information is of course to read the flight manual aerobatic aircraft have much larger flight envelopes but they may have weight or other restrictions now this is the cs22 for an aerobatic aircraft in green you can see it's a much bigger area on the flight envelope compared to the utility uh, I've adjusted this such that you know, the max maneuvering speed is identical, but to do that, I've had to reduce the wing loading. So often you will see that there might be wingspan limitations and certainly fuselage weight limitations for aircraft that have either utility or aerobatic uh, capabilities. Uh, you see you've got a much larger negative stall region as available as well. The next bit is where things get a little bit pear-shaped and a lot of people don't necessarily understand very well, and this is where it comes into gust loads. CS22 defines that the sailplane must be able to handle a plus and minus 15 metre per second gust up to max rough air. It does not define what max rough air is, but it does give you the set of equations that you need to plow through to determine the slope of this line. In this case, I've drawn this diagram so where the minus 15 metre per second gust touches the negative G limit, you get VB, which is your max rough airspeed. CS22 also defines that you must be able to survive a plus 7.5 metre per second gust and a minus 7.5 metre per, per second gust all the way out to VD. And you can see that this also touches the, uh, the limit load at on the negative side and there's a fair bit of headroom on the positive side. I'll just jump ahead for one slide. If, however, you draw it this way, you end up expanding the negative G envelope to cover these points. Uh, that's important. The aircraft designer sets uh, the max rough airspeed and then has to demonstrate that the structure is able to withstand those gusts. There's no equation or other guide to say what max rough air is set to. People already will be doing the mathematics in their head and go, geez, 15 metres per second, that is a 30 knot gust. This is well and truly into thunderstorm kind of category and you're right it is it's pretty severe uh, anyone who's gone into a gust and seen the wingtips bend all the way up and gone geez i didn't know the wings bent that far yep you're up into this kind of margin up here for those of us who've experienced the other end down at the minus 15 meter per second gust yeah that's pretty exciting uh, that water bottle that you thought was securely under your elbow is no longer under your elbow. Uh, 
the, the contents of the side pocket of the aircraft, including the maintenance release and the pen and everything else that's accumulated in there is now floating around the cockpit somewhere. And every bit of dirt in the seat pan uh, has now gone up to the, uh, the canopy via that small gap between your eyes and your sunglasses somehow. I don't know how that happens. Uh, and you're more than likely going to end up with bruises on your legs or shins where they've contacted the instrument panel unless you've got toe loops in your uh, rudder pedals. Other areas where you can experience this kind of thing, very severe rotor. It's uh, very, very uncomfortable if you're in this kind of, cat in this kind of territory. 7.5 metres per second, that's a 15 knot gust. This is one thing to remember here is, and I've made a note of it here, is this makes the assumption that the sailplane, and it's a, and it's a design criteria, this makes the assumption that the glider is operating at smooth air and then suddenly encounters this rapid change in angle of attack by hitting a gust. You can get the equivalent by if you are flying in strong sink, say at about 7.5 knots down, and then running into strong lift at about 7.5 knots up. That's the equivalent of hitting a 15 knot gust. So it's the, it's the delta between state A and state B. So you can very easily end up in this kind of territory at V and E on a good summer's day, you know, 7.5 knots. Um, of lift around the place and sink. Just noting the comments there. Um, what happens if you're out into this part of the uh, envelope when you hit these gusts? It's called a um, you know, gust stall, effectively. Uh, to get into those corners, you stall the aeroplane. Um, one of the things I made mention on the previous slide, excuse me, I'll just go back one. Some of the older vintage gliders, uh, the 15 metre per second gust is actually a 10 metre per second gust. That's not as bad as it sounds in the design standard for positive gust here. Uh, CS22 uh, has a, a gradient between uh, the still air and the 15 metre per second gust, it's a sinusoidal gradient. Many of the old design codes uh, assumed a sharp edge gust where the aircraft suddenly develops a change in angular attack instantaneously to the equivalent of a 10 metre per second change in vertical speed. That ends up getting a very, much more severe G response than having this sinusoidal gradient. So uh, the older design standard of 10 meter per second gust is more severe than what it sounds or I should say the 15 meter per second gust is not quite severe as it sounds because it's a bit more real world than this sharp edge gust assumption. Back in the days they didn't have computers and electronic calculators to help work it all out. I will point out that the slope of these lines is dependent on the design of the glider uh, it is very heavily dependent on wing loading and to a certain degree uh, aspect ratio. So if you have a, a low wing loading, these lines get steeper. If you have a, um, a low aspect ratio wing, these lines get less steep. Uh, so you cannot apply these these lines from one type of glider and transport them across to another type of glider because the designs are inherently different. In our case, our touring motor glider was operating just beyond V and E. Uh, it was still within the prescribed flight envelope, which is why we're quite concerned about what's going on because it should not have occurred, flutter event should not have occurred uh, within the flight envelope. I'm sorry, Kevin. Um, would have thought you'd been able to see the, uh, the mouse as I'm waving it around. Um, 
Just lost my train of thought, my mistake. So the, uh, the flutter should not have occurred within that V and E to VD diagram. So uh, our leading suspicion at the moment is that it, it has suffered some kind of damage. And I'll be talking about that at the next uh, webinar in a couple of weeks time. The other one to remember with these gust diagrams is they are proportional to the gust, uh, the slope of these lines, the gust strength. So uh, you can get a reasonable idea that it's roughly a linear spacing of gust strength between VB and VD for this as the gusts decrease. Um, max rough air is defined around very, very rough conditions. Uh, the the uh, 7.5 meter per second gust is actually achievable in real world typical soaring conditions during summer. Uh, the other one is, and it's not that common in Australia, is ridge running. Uh, I've certainly achieved it uh, from personal experience. We had a ridge with a number of spurs on it. The wind was quartering the ridge to it some degree, so it wasn't completely 90 degree perpendicular to the ridge. Running uh, on an upwind beat, coming up, flying through the dead air behind and above a spur, popping over the spur and finding all the lift again on the other side. Um, yes, I was still within max rough air, but it's close. And yeah, the, uh, there was a lot of uh, wing bending involved with that one, which I was uh, duly inspected the aircraft afterwards. So uh, the 15 metre per second gust requirement is, is difficult to achieve in typical flying conditions unless you are in very extremes. Uh, it is relatively easy to achieve in many circumstances this 7.5 metres per second gust in real world conditions at V and E. Are there any other questions? Um, please stick your hand up or uh, and I can try and unmute you. Max has said, do any of the flight data recorders we have show this stuff on downloading? Typically we will have simply um, a flight log of airspeed location, things like that. No. Uh, we're very lucky in the circumstances of this particular aircraft that it had a, a Dynon autopilot fitted that is recording this flight data at about, as far as I can tell, some in the order of four or five hertz, so about four or five samples a second. Chris, you got anything to add? Uh, I think some discussion on um, V and E uh, being smooth air uh, is probably relevant because if you look at this thing where the gust envelope 7.5 metres per second goes out to V and E, um, there might be people inclined to think they could fly all the way up to V and E in those sort of conditions. Um, smooth air is recommended. Um... Certainly hitting gusts at V&E, you're going to get a, a much greater response, even if you're hitting a, a, a relatively moderate gust and getting a minus 1G or something, that's still pretty uncomfortable for the average person. Um, and even uh, getting a 3G response out the other end of it is still pretty severe. The, uh, you will certainly know all about it if you're flying hard and fast uh, and you're running into turbulence at that kind of speed. Peter has said, surely the initial damage was caused by a heavy landing aggravated by a flutter episode. Most likely. Um, the investigation could not see any sign of early damage to the best that we were able to determine. That meant 
simply meant that the damage from the flutter uh, was most likely uh, obscuring or covered up the, uh, the previous damage. Um, there's a couple of uh, videos on YouTube published by the British Gliding Association, which I'll make reference to in the next webinar. Uh, one shows a, uh, a glider that has uh, the lower root rib of the fins being damaged and that's caused a loss of stiffness um, and allowed flutter to happen within below VNA on that particular glider. And there's another one that shows a uh, few uh, large damage to a stand label and showing the loss of stiffness in the rear fuselage as a result of that. Form two evaluation flights to V&E, yes, they are, they are still required. Um, the best, and as Max has said, go to V&E or the best speed for the conditions of the Form two test flight. Certainly recommend doing uh, the V&E run on the post Form two test flight in as still air conditions as you can. Um, you can tolerate obviously some degree of air movement. Um, if you do not go to V and E on your post form two test flight, you need to annotate that inside the cover of the maintenance release. And there's a uh, a little box there to uh, fill in for that. Uh, Scott has said he's seen a CT ultralight that was flying at V&E and rather excited by a pilot that broke very similar here, diagonal cracks in the carbon boom in front of the fin. Um, again, I'd have to go and have a look at what the ultralight uh, code was. This represents CS22. Um, different standards have different requirements and the, uh, the ultralight code will have a different gust requirement. Um, than what we do. One of the things to remember that with some of these um, other design codes like the LSA code and the ultralight codes is they have a maximum weight limit. That's quite restrictive. Uh, that means the aircraft is strong enough to safely fly, but often doesn't have a lot of margins if it's damaged. Uh, or and it doesn't necessarily have the same kind of damage tolerance that we're used to within JR22, CS22, or even under the old B BVS. So uh, some of these aircraft, if they do have damage, um, really don't have the capacity after they have been damaged to really survive too well. Uh, Drew has said flutter onset can be very sudden. Yes, it can indeed. Um, in this case, and I'll talk about it in a couple of weeks' time, it took about three seconds from what we can see um, in the data. It's a bit rough because the, uh, the data being called was, wasn't being recorded at a high enough frequency. The uh, frequency of oscillation from the flutter was much higher than what the uh, data was being recorded. But it had about three seconds between what we can see as normal kind of vibration in the aircraft and lateral G loads through to the failure point. And you can see there's a build up there. Uh, in this case, we suspect it was flying through a thermal. It's picked one wing up, uh, remembering that as the wing picks up, it's rolling the fuselage over. It's a T-tail design. So the, uh, the mass at the top of the fin has tried to stay where it was, it's rocked the fin over. The uh, stiffness in the fuselage has then sprung that mass back across the other side. And over three seconds, that um, oscillation has built up to the point where it's started to cause major structural damage. Um, Any comments on the risk of unintentionally providing a flight control input well above one third of rough areas and cash above VB, say yanking it up? Um, I'm not sure you'll get a PIO whilst you're flying unless you're over controlling. Normally, you have a PIO or a 
will require some other input. Normally, um, if you're on a, a tow rope behind a tug, it's the um, over control from the pilot and whatever uh, side forces or vertical forces being applied by the tow rope on the nose. PIO is on the ground, you've got the aircraft response from contacting the ground, setting up a pitch response that the pilot's then over controlling. In the air, um, you can get aircraft that are very sensitive to the fugoid uh, response. Um, most notably, I think, with all flying tails. Um, I do recall being back in university and flying with Janus A that RMIT was using at the time and uh, doing the stick free stability test where you trim it for a certain speed. Change that speed by forcing it away from that trimmer condition and then letting go of the controls and having the aircraft response uh, become quite a roller coaster as it um, tries to slow down and overcompensates and speeds up and over constant um, overcompensates and slows down again it becomes uh, quite interesting in a very short order of time. So in terms of putting pilot input in all you have to do really is um, grab the stick and hold it steady so it's no longer a free stick condition. I haven't heard of anybody setting up a PIO as a result of rough air and flight control input. I don't know if you have Chris. No, you're on mute, Chris. I was just chasing the mouse around the screen. <laughs> uh, no, I haven't had a, I haven't heard of a in-flight um, PIO event uh, in um, in uh, a long, long, long time. Uh, and as you, as you say, the previous ones are because there's be, been no one on the controls and the thing's done a fugoid type type uh, event. Yeah. Um, all right. Scott, yes, love flying golf, whiskey, Zulu. I only ever got to fly it that one time because we had a, a group of students who all had to go, go and do that fugoid experiment. But anyway, Jason, I wonder if this instance the pilot had his feet on the rudder pedals. Well, um, funny you should mention that. Um, and I was going to talk about that in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, when you turn on the autopilot, what's the instinctive thing to do? And of course, is take your hands and feet off the control. Uh, the flight manual does say to keep your feet on the pedals at all times. Um, it's the pilot can't remember exactly where their feet were. It's, there's some video footage later in the flight where it's very clear that there's only uh, one foot being applied to the controls. That's to keep it straight. Um, the, you're right. There is no autopilot servo on the rudder. And it's only a, a very simple two-axis control. It's, not a big airplane it's not ex that expensive um, so most likely no and i'll talk a little bit about uh, damping of controls with hands and feet in a couple of weeks time um, thanks this is great stuff but why are we using a cs22 standard to look at an lsa incident uh, from tc um, remarkably tc the uh, flight envelope is very very similar not surprisingly the um, gas requirements are all the same the definition of speeds is all the same the only real major difference is that there's a plus four up four g limit that is constant all the way across the airspeeds and a minus two g limit that it's constant all the way across for the airspeeds um, in this instance the uh, flight envelope was not necessarily the problem. It was the understanding of V and E and the understanding of what max rough air is. In the, because it was a touring motor glider, max rough air was actually expressed as a maximum cruise speed. So uh, the aircraft was being operated above what was the maximum recommended cru cru cruise speed. That just happens to correspond to max rough air. So in discussion with the pilot, um, very, they were very hazy on what really constituted rough air and under what conditions you could fly out to higher air speeds. I will point out that the V and E on this aircraft is a little rubbery. This aircraft was originally imported into the US. It got sold from the US and brought and imported to Australia. In US, 
um, there is a maximum airspeed of 120 knots applied to LSA. In Europe, the same aircraft type has a, a V&E of 140 knots, or somewhere in that order of magnitude. So there is this legislative V&E that's on the C of A of this aircraft when it got brought into Australia. So the uh, operator considered V&E to be a little bit rubbery and a grey zone because they knew that this aircraft type could be operated much faster in Europe than just because of the rules in the US of A. Um, Alan Wilson below 10,000 feet, so I can go to V&E, but way flying. Yes, I was going to talk about this in the next episode as well. Um, this is all presented in indicated airspeed. True airspeed um, has an impact, and as you get higher and higher, your indicated airspeed get results in a much higher true airspeed. And I was going to talk about the requirement to have a V&E table for operation above 10,000 feet. That's all to you get to look forward to in a couple of weeks' time. Was it tested to 140k? The type has been tested to 140 knots, Max. Um, so again, this event occurred within, within the flight envelope. So it wasn't encountering flutter because they've gone outside the envelope. There was something not quite right with the design or not quite right with this individual aircraft. The um, previous incidents have been blamed on elevator flutter, which has resulted in many aircraft having been fitted with a much heavier elevator structure as a result. Looking at the photos from uh, the limited photos I have from these aircraft, not convinced it was necessarily elevator flutter and increasing the mass that's at the top of the fin is possibly not actually helping the cause here. But it's an LSA, it goes back to the, to the type certificate holder and the aircraft designer, and it's their problem. Um, so does the envelope at altitude just bring back the V&E light? Yes. Short answer. Um, because again the gust lines i think are again at sea level the gust response changes a little bit with um are you dealing with a gust that has a true airspeed of 15 meters per second or an, or a indicated airspeed of 15 meters per second normally it's that you treat the gust that 15 meters per second gust as a true airspeed so it's a 15 meters per second true airspeed all the way up with altitude so that the uh, the shape of those lines don't change. Any other questions? I'll just make a comment if I can, uh, and uh, on uh, on this one. There was a comment earlier as to whether or not the aircraft had, had suffered previous damage and the maintenance records didn't indicate there was any damage. Uh, but as we all know, pilots have a habit of not reporting heavy landings um, and uh, also not uh, doing proper inspections. So it is uh, just sort of highlights that um, it is important that if there is a heavy landing in an aircraft that you really ought to, ought to report it and uh, make sure that the aircraft is uh, properly inspected by by somebody who's familiar with the, with the type. Yes, um, this aircraft has a fixed tail wheel. It's um, known to be a bit tricky on crosswinds. You need to get the crosswind landing technique just right. Um, the suspicion, and suspicion only, is that it's had a, an event in its past where it's been landed in a crosswind a bit sideways and there's been a, um, an overstress from the tail wheel into the fuselage. But we haven't found proof of that. Uh, unfortunately. There are human factors. Is there a formal statement on what a hard landing is? That's a real, that, that is a difficult one to answer. There is a design requirement in the in the, um, in the standards 
that define a maximum load that the undercarriage is designed for. So a hard landing is an, is an arrival that exceeds those loads. What it feels like to the lay pilot. Um, honestly, caution is your best friend here. If you've had an arrival that um, you said, well, that was a, that was a bit rough. Uh, yeah, go and have a good thorough look at the aeroplane. If it, does, if it exceeds the design loads, it's going to break the undercarriage. Um, uh, at least permanently deform it. Let, yes, there is, yeah, let, there's going to be there's going to be some level of uh, level of uh, obviousness to it. The uh, the the design code, the CS22 envelope that we presented here, you can draw something similar for the undercarriage and all sorts of components of the aeroplane with um, speeds and NZ charts. In the terms of the undercarriage, it might be a vertical G load versus a horizontal G load or a side G load. Um, in so the idea of these limits is the aircraft is not allowed to permanently deform until after you get past these limits once you're past these limits the aircraft is allowed to be permanently bent it's not supposed to break up until beyond a, a second set of limits with a one point it's, it's effectively these design was times 1.5 so the aircraft not supposed to fracture or break up until you've exceeded 1.5 times these limit loads. However, um, steel tube undercarriages or uh, metal undercarriages will bend once you've exceeded limit load. Um, more than likely, if you've had a, an arrival that you've said, oh, that was, we, we really felt that one, there's a good chance you may have bent something somewhere. Um, if in doubt, have a good look around. Uh, this, there's no room really here for it, she will be right. Is the G meter accurate enough anyway? Depends where the G meter is mounted. Um, is it measuring G load at the undercarriage or G load at the instrument panel? But most of the time it will measure G load at the instrument panel and you'll get some kind of pitching response when you touch on the ground so that the aircraft G meter was probably going to read different to what the, the, the undercarriage experienced. In this case with the Dynon um, autopilot there is a digital G meter and apparently the uh, the sensor for it is on the center of gravity or very close to it so it should be relatively um, accurate. For example if you have a, um, a G meter that goes to plus five and you meter shows something like that is it triggered to inspect? Yeah Definitely. Just as you do a wing frequency, you can also do a tail fin frequency. Yes, I was going to talk about this in a couple of weeks' time as well. Um, harder to do if you've got a tail drag. You need to suspend the, uh, the tail off the ground uh, for a fair old distance of the tail boom so you get the full um, range of motion of the tail boom. The DG1000 tail, 204 cycles per minute as measured today. Um, if you wouldn't mind Scott uh, sending me an email about the technique you use to achieve that please for the tail cycles and was it vertical or, hor or a twisting horizontal rotation of the left right of the uh, top of the fin. Extending those if there was clear damage you have mentioned any internal damage if it was able to be fixed. Um, very difficult to have a look inside of that aircraft at the moment. Uh, repairs are uh, going to be started shortly. We'll have a better look inside. The um, people doing the investigation did get permission to drill a hole and put a um, inspection camera up inside. Um, they had thought they had found something initially, but it turned out that was uh, how they made the aircraft from production. There was some um, core material stuck on the inside of the uh, Fuselage was just absorbed, it's just there to soak up excess resin from a, a, a joint, but it looked rather suspicious like there was um, a, no fiberglass on one patch of the inside of the fuselage there for a while. But that was resolved with the, uh, the type certificate holders. So we still need to go and repair the, uh, repair the aircraft and have a good look at that, see what's going on tail on the ground um yeah look it's a as good as any um 
it gives you an idea if something's changed. Look at it that way. Um, so Scott's done a tail frequency. I'm assuming it's uh, left, right on top of the fin, is it, Scott? Um, I'll just see if I can find you on my list of people here, Scott. And Oop, there you are. Um, Scott, can, uh, are you on mic now? I believe I am. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so just using the um, that phone app that you can put on your phone does the uh, cycles per minute automatically mm -hmm. and has some sort of little quality check on how good it is at the time. Mm -hmm. And so that was taped to the end of the tailplane. Uh, so it gets the most movement and just swing the front of the fin sideways. Yep, and, okay. And yes, I have the uh, tail on the ground with the rated uh, pressure in the tyre um, and whether it's right or wrong it's repeatable and last year I had uh, 202 and this year it was 204 which is pretty damn close enough so yeah the catch there is being repeatable um, so keeping the type keeping the conditions identical uh, will be critical on that the other one is to uh, be careful with the mass of the phone you're using you're adding mass at the top of the fin um, some of these measurements can be quite sensitive to a change in mass, particularly if it's uh, got a fair bit of leverage on it, so a very tall fin. So um, a, a small change in frequency might simply be you've used a different phone this time, it's got a different weight. Yeah. I'd be happy to uh, hear options on doing a better measurement. Yeah, I, I discussed something similar with the operator of this particular aircraft concerned and the only other way around it is to get a, a proper accelerometer that you can then record to a, uh, a, a PC or something like that and then mm. always use that one accelerometer so it keeps the weight constant or normally these things are uh, way about the same with a couple of 20 cent coins so it's less likely to influence the results yep. compared to the mass of the tailplane and everything else. I've done it over uh, you know, four different aircraft, the same type, mm. and I have got between one, uh, 200 and 205 for all of them. Yep, sure. All right, thanks, Scott. Thank you. Um, should he have aborted earlier after the loud bang? Yeah, if you start hearing loud bangs from your airframe, particularly a series of loud bangs from your airframe, that's a pretty good reason to turn around and go back and land and see what's going wrong. Um, there was a bit of push on itis here. Uh, I was pretty keen to get where they wanted to go. Um, yeah. Damn good idea if you hear, start hearing loud bangs to turn around and go home. Any more from anybody else? Please publish the name of the frequency app. Um, Scott, if you happen to have it handy, if you can put it in chat uh, or send me an email and I'll stick it out to uh, everybody later on. All right, um, I'll just about call it quits. The next webinar is going to be talking about Flutter um, and it'll be 8 p.m. Eastern time, so 7.30 my time here in Adelaide on Wednesday the 1st of June. Uh, and just looking at Scott Lennon, yeah, if you go to the App Store and start type and do a search for wing frequency, I think you will find at least one or two apps there along those lines. I've seen it used nominally on um, wing, t wing vibration, but uh, we were talking about using it for uh, other oscillations on the aeroplane as well. The other one we were talking about with the owner was um, being able to put a known torque on the, uh, the tail and measuring the deflection and they're going to go away and see just what, what they can do there and then compare it to other owners. Uh, as a an idea during each annual inspection to just see what's going on. <laughs>
Right, anything else from anybody else? Well, thank you all. I hope that's um, been informative. I'll stop the uh, recording now.